please welcome Catherine Marriott OAN. So it is with my great pleasure to introduce our four panellists. Bryce said in a session earlier that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, and I can assure you that I'm in the right room because when I was told that I had to facilitate this panel, uh, the fist pumps were real because it's all of these guys are farmers. They're all actually utilising the tech. They've got on-ground experience. You know, down-to-earth is the theme of this conference. Uh, and so I personally get really excited when you are given an opportunity to hear from farmers because there's lots of innovation and um, tech being developed in agriculture. But unless you bring the farmers along with you, you it's not grounded in something that's going to potentially have impact. So um, I'll ask for our panellists to introduce themselves and we'll start with you, Luke, uh, and just give everyone a little bit of a snapshot of your business and your background, please. All right, thanks, Catherine, um, and thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke Chaplin. I'm from Cloncurry in northwest Queensland. Uh, my company is Sky Kelpie. Uh, we're basically just an R&D stage for using drones to muster livestock. Um, I've been well supported by Farmers to Founders, Nuffield Australia, uh, Meat and Livestock Australia and Queen the Queensland Government. Um, we did some great trials last year. We've validated our assumptions, very excited, um, and we're going to keep going full steam ahead. Fee. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Fee Turner, um, so I'm a vineyard owner in Tasmania, Jingles Creek Vineyard, uh, the best wine in Australia for sure. <laughs> um, and I also have an ag tech startup, so you know, we were having problems in the vineyard, so of course I wanted to solve my own problems and Bitwise was born and now we're in uh, grapes and berries doing artificial intelligence for forecasting. And we just actually, um, off the back of coming back from America, some of the team, not me, but some of the team uh, where we got in the top 10 new products at the World Ag Expo with a collaboration with a robotics company, which is super exciting. So cool. Well done, Fee. That's, yeah, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> top 10 in the world, global startup. Well done. Hans. Yeah, uh, Hans Loder. I'm a, um, I'm a viticulturalist for Penley Estate, based in uh, Coonawarra. Uh, I'm also a 2021 Nuffield Scholar, supported by Wine Australia, and, and looking into my project title is uh, Here Come the Robots, but what do we do with the data? So I've been, um, been seeing what, uh, what can be done and how to integrate and best use data uh, in the business, in the vineyard, to get insights and work more efficiently. Awesome. Thanks, Hans. Brad? Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Brad Egan. I come from uh, Scadden, Western Australia, uh, just north of the, the beautiful town of Esperance, which, yeah, I'm not sure if many people know where that is, but some of the best beaches in the world, I'll give it a bit of a plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, broadacre cropping, 3,400 hectares of wheat, barley, canola and legumes. And yeah, we face many constraints in our business, uh, be it from our soils to changing climate, so, you know, implementing as much data and precision ag to try and be as efficient and sustainable going forward. Awesome. And what Brad hasn't told you is that he's this year's uh, Australian Young Innovative Farmer of the Year. So he's, we're in very esteemed company with this panel. Um, so Hans, I might start with you. How do you choose, like there's so much data and so many conversations going on around data has value. Data is, you know, don't sell your data. But can you tell us, how do you choose the types of data that are important to your business? And everyone chime in if you've got something to add. Yeah, I think probably one of the early pieces of advice that I was given in, in my Nuffield journey, but um, it, and also, so an early piece of advice, and what I've and the best way that I can answer this question is around to the idea concept of doing a data audit, because for every business, the data points that are important are how you measure your productivity or whatever may differ. So by undertaking a data audit, you can see the data that you are collecting. And this is something that I found throughout my Nuffield journey, actually, is that I'd go and make farm visits, and generally I'd get a response of, oh, look, we don't do very much, or we don't collect very much data. And then we'd be going around the property, and I'd be taking little notes on what they're telling me, and, and also what data. They're saying, oh, well, we've got the frost fan, so they have telemetry. We have you know, our water meters, that feeds back data to this other system. So in isolation, there's actually a lot of data being collected. And so getting an understanding of what are those data points that are being collected, and that can set you up also going forward, where you can say, well, what are those data points that I still need to help me make better decisions? And so doing that data audit, bringing together what data you already collect, what data you'd like to have, 
and that can also lead, then take you to the next step of saying, well, I understand now what, I, what data I want. What's the ag tech solution that best fits that requirement? Yeah, awesome. Luke, what would you like to add to that? We were just talking out the back. Well, look, yeah, being asked to be on this panel was uh, very humbling, and I'm just like, what do I really know about data? I'm just like, holy hell. But um, <laughs> I've come to the realisation that I am surrounded by data, and the first data that I was working with, with what I'm doing at the moment, is the stats on uh, helicopter and gyrocopter deaths while mustering livestock. Um, also, the rising costs and all the different um, things we can do as a use case and application for drones that'll help our on-farm data. And then I'm thinking, oh wait, I'm actually capturing a bit of data. I've got this high resolution video feed that can be used for education, training, and developing AI. So actually, I am surrounded by data. Happy to be on the train. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Fee? Yeah, and I think it's important to go, well, what is the problem that I'm trying to solve? And then start with that. If you're gonna get new data or more data and go, well, you know, what do I wanna solve? And then just work backwards. Well, what data do I, do I need to solve that problem? And then how do I collect that data? Or do I already have that data? Um, otherwise you can just have, you know, a data management nightmare. Yeah, and what's, give us some examples of what Bitwise helps with. Like, how did you sort of decide what data you were starting to collect? Yeah, so for us, um, the data that we were collecting is that we wanted to understand the phenological stages and know what's actually happening with the fruit. How many actual fruit are there on the plant without a human going out there and counting it? Because um, what we found was that humans are terribly, terrible, terrible at counting. Anything over 100, we don't do well. Um, so great job for machines, right, and AI to do that. Um, and so we went about, you know, teaching our artificial intelligence to count what's actually out there. So then you get a better picture of your variability um, and then that helps with you know forecasting what's coming to the market where are you going to put your staff and a ho whole lot of other things awesome good and brad you've been collecting data for 10 years you don't look old enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, well in broad acre cropping there's that much data flowing in all the time so you know i agree totally with what everyone's saying it's about you know understanding what your end goal is and then working back from that um, because that's one thing that since I came back to the farm in 2017, mm. after doing my agribusiness degree, is yeah, I wanted to be utilising much more ag data and make it work for me rather than just collecting it and having it sitting on a hard drive. Yep. Actually, you know, doing the numbers and figuring out, you know, what's the best decision going forward. Yeah, and I think that's key too because, you know, like Riverine Plains, which is who I work for, we've got um, 450 members and one of the biggest challenges is that they all bring to me is that we're collecting all this data but how do you actually turn it into a decision making juncture for your business? Can you give any insights into how you do that on your farm? Yeah so it, it's been a, a, a learning journey, it's, very, it's developed over the years since I've you know, started this process back on our own farm but you know, it's been extremely rewarding so for an example uh, using data layers to identify areas of uh, underproductive land and then identifying solutions to then be able to you know, ameliorate them to raise their potential. Yep. Um, then, then it's a case of understanding, right, what's the cost of that solution um, and what, what's the return on investment going to be? So a lot of on-farm trials um, and yeah, doing all the numbers to understand the full financial implication at the end. Yeah, awesome. Um, Hans, back to you, how do you, like data is not the only thing, right? So what else do you need, what are the skills do you need on farm to best utilise your data? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tie this in with an answer that um, Fee just gave Great. in terms of the, the data collection. And I, I saw a post recently where they were talking about um, the donkey work of having lots of really highly qualified individuals out collecting data. And the reason that they're collecting the data is because they're trained in representative data collection yeah. and you know how not to bias their samples and et cetera, et cetera. So I'd suggest that with the ag tech that's available and that's into the future, a lot of that sampling work will be, will be done for us. Yeah. Um, but I think what then becomes really important is that while well, I'm a bit of culturalist, so I'll truly be working as a viticulturalist, instead of being out there doing bunch counts, say, for crop estimation, I'll have that data, but it'll be more important that I understand how to interpret that data, understand whether it's representative. I think also know how to slice and dice that data in terms of you know, um, 
as a trained agronomist or as a viticulturalist, you'd know, well, what are the indices that count that tell you about plant performance? Or yeah. that. So not just business performance, but also the crop that you're growing. Yeah. And so using the data, again, getting the data sets you need, bringing them together, um, spending your time doing that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, awesome. And Fee, I saw you nodding. Did you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, I'm totally on that um, bandwagon as well. Like, get the right people or the right systems collecting the data so we can empower our skilled farm workers and knowledge workers to bring their knowledge to the data. Like, there's, um, you know, the, the ag tech is not going to replace farmers. It's not going to re replace agronomists. It's going to help them do their job better. Yep. And, um, you know, there's one agronomist for every 7,000 hectares in Australia or something like that. So, the, you know, pulled really, really thin. So how can we get those people working more efficiently um, on the things that are important um, by giving them the data that they need and, and the tools that they need to cut and copy and paste and pivot? Yep. Awesome. Um, Luke, might start with you. When you look at the ag tech data collection space, what do you think is holding farmers back from uptaking technology? Like, what are some of the blockers that you think we as an industry government need to be addressing? Um, I mean, I guess it's partly generational. My old man is really scared of using his iPhone. Yep. Probably the most data he uses is from the rain gauge to boast to the neighbours <laughs> how much rain he gets. Um, but I guess it's just education, support and training. And it just makes it a lot less scary. And if you can also quite simply, I think, prove the benefits to it of using this data, then it's a no-brainer. And obviously, maybe starting with economics, obviously, work work smarter not harder but also if it's going to save money you know it's all there so I think um, your other panelists will probably be able to answer this question a bit better but that's yeah that's not true <laughs> we spoke earlier about some of the things that some of the regulations perhaps with aerial drones out of sight that sort of thing yeah totally yeah and that's a huge barrier for my solution um, and something that we'll be working on uh, with MLA and Queensland DAF again this year um, it's very difficult, uh, complex, expensive to fly a drone beyond visual line of sight in Australia. Uh, my property up at Cloncurry, we're the first in Australia to have beef loss accreditation for the purpose of mustering, um, um, which is really exciting, um, but it needs to be a lot more streamlined, a lot more practical. Um, so um, I'll be meeting with the, the Minister, Catherine King. She doesn't know it yet, but I'll be going to Canberra <laughs> at some stage. And if, yeah, anyway, I, I have an in with her, but if anyone else does, all good um, <laughs> because we just need to show them the the real benefits yeah. um, it's economic but it's also social with animal welfare sustainability there's so much great stuff that this technology is bringing um, I think that the regulators and government I mean so CASA sits under the Department of Infrastructure which is why I'm beelining for Catherine yeah. um, but I guess they just need to understand what the benefits are mm. um, Australia is best placed in the world actually to be a pioneer with extending the regulations in this space because of our low air risk and ground risk in rural Australia. So we can be the first in the world to be doing this, yeah. um, but I'll also be visiting other countries uh, with Nuffield and Jody's here today, g'day Jody. Um, and that'll be really helpful as well. New Zealand are quite progressive as well in this space. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else like to address barriers to adoption of ag tech? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to agree with Luke, definitely on that, that point. Uh, the first point on generational plus also you know there's that much ag tech out there that yeah at times people get a bit overwhelmed and don't think it can actually be implemented at a practical level whereas you know just last week uh, i was lucky enough to be able to host a group of young farmers over back home as part of the young farmers forum through rabobank and yeah they were every single person that attended wanted to you know learn how data how we we're implementing data and they took so much away of actually get seeing it getting implemented because, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, where we are, we've actually, our annual average rainfall has dropped by 15%, wow. which in a dry land cropping operation isn't the, the best thing, obviously, but through data analysis and precision ag, we've actually able to, been able to increase our wheat yield by 40% over the same period. Wow. So they just took so much out of that, seeing it actually implemented at the, you know, farm level, mm -hmm. but then also, Important. you know, getting a few tips along the way, I guess. But then as far as other barriers to adoption, I, in my personal view, it's connectivity is 
you know, it has the potential to be the biggest accelerator for uptake of ag tech. Yeah. But at the moment, it's probably one of the biggest handbrakes. <coughs> because, yeah, with so many, so much of this stuff now, it's becoming cloud-based and you need internet to be able to fully utilise it. And it's all well and good to have good connection in the office, but so much of this stuff needs, you know, service out in the field, whereas, you know, it's hard enough to make a phone call yeah. at the moment, let, let, let alone um, access the internet. So, you know, that's where I see it being a, a big challenge going forward. If the connectivity isn't right in regional areas, then, yeah, a lot of this ag tech stuff won't get fully utilised. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Hans, have you got anything to add? Yeah, it, um, it's probably in terms of that piece of bringing farmers along that we heard of just previously is um, understanding the challenges is one thing, but I, I, I think also for farmers to understand what's possible. Yep. Like we're not professionals in the tech space or even the data space maybe. Um, and so, you know, are we asking the right questions? Yeah. Like are we challenging the tech enough? Um, so understanding how some of these processes work could be a bit of a barrier to adoption. Just you know, misunderstanding, yeah. misunderstandings because not right asking the right questions. And, and have, have you got an example of when you've sort of thought, "Oh, I wish I'd asked that question." That's a bit of a dolly dixer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you've definitely put me on the spot there, but um, it, it could be. In, in terms of maybe data analysis, just mm. um, understanding some of the concepts around statistics, you know, yeah. how can you look at data differently? How can it be presented? Um, you know, that could be from basic statistics to, actually I'll go left field, just a thought that ex an example that's come to mind now is, so I, I volunteer under the CSIRO STEM in schools. Yeah. And um, we challenged, we had some weather station data and as part of the class, we, were, we challenged the students to say, well, what do you see with this data? And we, it was a setup. Yeah. So we had winter and summer temperatures, and we were trying to show a skewed distribution. It was year nine and 10 students, so they're looking at normal distributions and statistics. Yeah. And we're going, this data is clearly skewed, one to the lower end, one to the upper end. Of course, there was complete silence in the classroom. And it was, then we said, well, what's warmer and what's colder? Which season? It was summer and winter yeah. data. But, th you know, just knowing like we knew the answer, like it was yeah. intuitive that the, because I'd come across skewed data, that's why we set it up. Yeah. But, you know, thinking outside what you'd normally expect if you're sam a normal sample population, yeah. things like that. Yeah, and to your point earlier, having that knowledge, like you can't just rely on data, you've got to have your knowledge of the industry on the ground to underpin mm. and be able to make use of what it is that you're looking for and looking to achieve, so. And, and, and it also ties into, like that example ties into the importance of representative data collection. So yeah. taking the human element out of it can actually be a good thing, that if you sample the environment well, the data will, ref will reflect it, yeah. will reflect what the reality of what's happening out there. Hmm. Very good. Have you got anything to add, Fee, around barriers to uptake? Yeah, I think, um as farmers, when we take on a piece of ag tech and a, and a new piece of ag tech, we've got to um, be willing to like put the time and effort into it as well to understand what we may need to do to make the system work or understand the data. Um, you know, quite often we hear like we, we, people go, oh, it should just plug and play and it should give me all the answers to my farm and it should just, you know you know, solve the problems of the world, basically. And, you know, that's not the reality. There's no, you know, silver bullet systems um, that can do everything. So, um, yeah, I think that we as farmers need to, when we're taking something on, make sure that we've got the time and want to put the, the effort into making, um, you know, making it work or working with the ag tech companies um, so we get the best out of that result and then, you know, can evaluate it properly. Awesome. I'm just going to put the audience on notice. If any of you would like to ask a question, there's mics down the front and I think there's some up the back. Um, but before we go to the audience, and don't worry, I have plenty of questions if you're all shy. Um, guys, in a farmer's life, typically they'll have 40 or 50 seasons to really nail something, like to understand how their system works. How can we better use ag tech to shrink that timeline to sort of four or five years? I'll start with you, Luke. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, I guess, well, 
I think first of all, getting putting yourself out there, getting out there, um, seeing different perspectives, seeing how different things are done. Um, you know, I think there's a whole lot of programs such as this, you know, and you see the word culture and agriculture. And I think events like this really bring out the best in that. Yeah. And I think when you rock up to things like this, you put your hand out and you meet people and it can be scary and you get rejected, but I've been rejected a lot. So just <laughs> do it. I think, I think the, I think, uh, you know, meeting with like-minded individuals mm -hmm. and I think that um, life experience can maybe shorten that 40 years or you'll get 80 years out of the 40 years or whatever. Yeah, awesome. Fee? I love this question because I had a berry grower from the UK um, come to my vineyard about five months ago and um, we we're just, you know, yarning about doing forecasting and stuff and he was like, oh, look, we don't need to use your system because I've spent the last 28 years working out how to forecast. And he said, but the great thing about your system is that all the new berry growers now don't have to spend that 28 years because they can just come and use you and what you've developed in the last year and a half you know, it's taken me 28 years. And I think that's the magic of um, ag tech. And what we can bring is we can really cut that time down so it's not at the end of your growing years that you fully understand that your farm, you can go in at the beginning of your growing years and understand it and then imagine what we can achieve in efficiency and bringing more produce to the market and reducing our waste and, um, you know, tackling some of these um, labour issues that we have because you're not spending 28 years trying to work it all out. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. Hans? Yeah, I'm going to go back to doing the data audit because that way you know the, the bits of data that are missing so you d you'll pick that up early and start collecting that data. I'd also say there's a bit of a leap of faith. Like you can't, I th it's important with the data audit you'll have to shed some data or, or identify, you'll, it'll be identified things that aren't really critical yeah. but it'll also identify those gaps in yeah. the data you're collecting and so by getting them um, It'll set you up as you as you collect. The sooner you start, the more data you've got to work with. Yeah. Uh, similarly, take a leap of faith, like collect some data sets which may or may not pay off okay. yep. um, down the line. So I, I do that as well. I'm, I'm not sure. I think I might need them. So collecting it now and I'll find out in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's also around that that piece of the data to help you make better decisions. Yep. So reducing the risk, working more effectively, um, better decision making, which will buy you years. Like if yeah, mm. absolutely. Awesome. Brad? Yeah, I fully agree with that, especially that, that last point, because you know, in broad acre cropping especially, but most forms of ag, a lot of the decisions we make, we only get one time of application on that particular decision and the only time we get to review whether it was a good thing is yeah at the end of the year come harvest or you know i'm not too sure on the whole viticulture side of things how how, how you measure it but um you know for us in broad acre cropping it's say a nitrogen application we only get to measure it at harvest time yep. once a year yep. which makes it difficult to understand you know multiple years of of um you know possibilities i guess so that's where when i first came back to the farm it was really about making the most of the data as well as understanding historical data and to try and get yeah those extra years under the belt without actually you know having living through them yeah living through them yeah, yeah. so I think you know I've, that's been the way that you know I've always viewed it but I've been making Velbrite maps for our paddocks for the last 10 years and as new data layers and formats come in you start bringing all that in and it's a ever-evolving beast um, but then, you know, going forward, like, and I'm still learning, but going forward, I think, you know, computer learning and machine learning is just going to help, you know, really fast track these processes to allow people to, you know, get a, get yeah. a fast track, I guess, and get an edge earlier. Awesome. Wonderful. Have we got any questions from the floor? Yes, the gentleman down the front. I think you've got to go and stand at the microphone, sir, or there's one just there, just in the corridor there. The man's pointing to it. Thank you, sir. Sorry, uh, Jim Williams, the poor man in the room. <laughs> um, I, I just wondered, in terms of, uh, you, you, we're talking about blockers to, um, uh, to, to real using of data in, in agriculture. I wondered, uh, is integration of particularly spatial data, um, uh, you know, better, fun, beta, better data integration, is, is that an issue, uh, firstly? And, and secondly, would 
access to you know world-class data scientists or data science skills be a you know just as 100 years ago no one knew what an agronomist was you knew who the blacksmith was but you mm. didn't have a mm. you didn't have an agronomist is it maybe that in 20 years time a key farm advisor may be a data scientist mm. I, I can probably answer that one yeah Hi, Hans. I, through my through the Nuffield project, I've actually um, feel pretty comfortable in answering this and to say that yes, it's maybe not the data scientist, but da it's a different separate field again is data engineering, and so your data managers. So those that warehouse you know, or store the data in a database um, in the, in the wine sector, Wine Australia supported a project called the Collaboriculture Initiative, which was about creating that common data model, so that structure, that schema around um, having common nomenclature, so for grapevine varieties, also how the data is stored for a vineyard, the base data of rows, posts, all, all that kind of thing, so that, that then be data, if the data is stored properly and it's also validated, so all the naming's right, well that's when you can get that the versatility of being able to easily export data and take it into different applications. Now, there's something else you're talking about, spatial, um, a spatial component with the data being a barrier to uptake. So can you repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, just um, um, I, I was thinking more in terms of there are a lot of different machinery vendors with a lot of data flowing off those machines. So how do you align your fertilizer applications, for example, with the pro yield or protein meter on your combine harvester. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, precision agriculture has to mean that where I'm standing is the same, whichever machine you read it from. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, is, is that in itself an issue that there's not that level of, you called it data engineering, I like that. Yeah, I, I, I can probably, I'll take a part of that answer and then hand over yeah, yeah. Um, that I think for, for different businesses, there'll be a different answer. Like for, for many, the opportunity will be there just to get an off-the-shelf solution and that'll be satisfactory. Others will need to go to that data management, data engineer and have a custom um, platform produced and, and that platform may feed off a database and maybe a, a, a dashboard which gives them the exact information that they need in that business to communicate what's going on. Um, and and then there, there may also be just synergies that work naturally between, between different ag tech, which will happen over time. But then I'll pass over. Yeah, so as far as the integration side of your question, um, yeah, it's definitely become a lot more prevalent in, in broad acre cropping. And you know, I always like to think of um, data platform integrations like a jigsaw um, puzzle. You need you know, everything perfectly matched up, otherwise they don't link together. Um, and it, it is getting a lot simpler as time goes on. Um, I, you know, I think we're just about out of the days of you know pulling USBs and um, you know compiling into one platform because there's that much uh, yeah, flow going both ways out of platforms now. But there still are limitations in some of these ag management um, programs uh, as far as they might be biased to a colour, um, which is is definitely a, an issue because y you're dead right. Like you need to be able to see every layer that you have at your disposal um, in, in one spot. Otherwise, you, you, you'd be missing out on some form of analysis. Guys, we're nearly out of time. So if anyone has any more questions, these guys will be around. I just wanted to quickly finish with a piece of advice from each of you for farmers in the room that are looking to try and better utilise or start the journey of um, data consolidation. So we'll start with you, Brad. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I've been thinking about this um, in the lead up to it and you know, I'll have to throw in the quote that um, my wonderful partner, Laura, <laughs> has taught me um, through either a, a podcast or a book, I can't remember, but don't spend 80% of your time on what makes you 20% of your profit. Yep. So basically the time in the office making, you know, doing the data analysis and um, making the proper management decision um, is far more valuable than operating a machine. Although I like driving tractors, so it's a bit of a balance. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Hans, just super quickly, we're out of time. Yeah, look, a common theme of mine is understand the data sets that you, you're collecting. Yeah. Fee? Um, for me, it would be um, that there's not 
a silver bullet. Yeah. You know, that, that it takes many systems. In any other industry that we go in, it takes many systems to run a factory or build a bridge or whatever it may be. And on farm, it's exactly the same. So, you know, don't don't think there's going to be one big monolithic beautiful system that does it for you all. When Fee told me that, I was crushed, <laughs> Luke. <laughs> I would say leverage off people like these guys who are passionate about it um, because they are really keen on adoption. Um, so they're absolutely going to give you uh, their time to help you along the way. Wonderful. Please join me in thanking our illustrious panel.